But if you would, open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 3. Chapter 3. And we're going to begin at verse 11. Father, I'm so grateful for the, um, the gift of being able to stand in front of these people and be able to bring to them something of your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is alive, that it has power, that even though it might seem strange that here we are gathered uh, looking together at, at, at a document that's some 2,000 years old or older, Lord, we know that, that it's your words to us today, right here, right now. And so speak to us and make it alive by your spirit. Make us alive to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the last time we were in the book of Acts, we saw this amazing incident that happened right there at one of the gates of the temple, an ornate gate called the, the Beautiful Gate. And Peter and John were walking up there, and this is after Jesus had ascended to heaven, after Jesus had done his amazing work on the cross, after the Holy Spirit had come down and done something amazing among the Christians there on the day of Pentecost, after Peter preached that amazing message on the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people uh, turned from their previous lives and said, we want to be followers of Jesus. In these early, dynamic, powerful days of the early church, Peter and John, they're walking up to the temple in order just to, at the, at the hour of prayer, they're going to pray because they, they didn't see themselves separate from Judaism. They, they saw themselves fulfilled in their Judaism. And, and so there they were going up to the temple to pray, and they saw this man, a lame man, who was some 40 years old, and he had been laying there at the gate, beautiful, for, for years and years, every day, begging alms. And then Peter and John, and they made eye contact with him, and it said, staring intently, it says, he looked right at that man, and he said, listen, I don't have any silver and gold to give you, which must have been a big disappointment to the beggar, because that's what he was looking for. But then Peter said, but what I do have, I'm going to give to you, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And with a remarkable gift of faith, I believe it was a supernatural gift of faith, that God gave Peter, he picked up that lame man and pulled him up, and instantly he was healed. And the Bible says that he was walking, he was jumping, he was praising God, because that man was miraculously healed. Well, that, that drew a lot of attention. There were a lot of people out at the temple courts, and immediately this man just screaming and shouting, and, and people know, hey, this is the guy, the lame guy. And then they wonder that, has he really been able to walk all this time? Maybe he's been ripping us off all these years. No, no, no. He was really actually miraculously healed just right there at that moment, walking and leaping and praising God, it says. And then at that very moment, Peter realized that he had an opportunity to speak to the crowd. And, and with all the boldness he had, because Peter, he wanted these people to hear about who Jesus was, what Jesus had done for them. I mean, I mean, Jesus, just a few weeks before, had died on a cross to pay for those people's sins. And many of them hadn't heard that message. And some of them, if they had heard the message, they hadn't been persuaded to embrace it yet. And so Peter was going to take that responsibility, take that opportunity, I should say, and preach to them right there. So verse 11, it says, Now as the layman who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as through our own power of goodness, or godliness, I should say, we had made this man walk. So Peter wisely took advantage of this gathering crowd. He said, here's an opportunity. The phenomenon of the miraculous has opened up an opportunity for me to tell these people about Jesus. It wasn't just enough that a miracle had happened, nor was it enough that the man who had been healed would just give a testimony of what happened. That The man didn't know much about Jesus, but Peter did. And Peter was going to use this opportunity to tell them about who Jesus was and what he had done for them on the cross. But I want you to notice what Peter did first. Peter said... Why look so intently at us as through our own power or godliness we have made that man walk? Peter, first thing he did was he denied that the healing was due to either his power or his godliness. This is always a temptation for those whom God uses. I believe God uses men and women in the world today. 
Sometimes he uses them in obvious ways. Sometimes he uses them in less obvious ways. But God uses men and women to accomplish his work today. And whenever God uses a man or a woman, there's always a temptation for that man, that woman, to, to act as if it's because they're so wonderful and that's why God used them. But no, Peter was wise enough to resist that temptation. So he said, no, it's not me. It's not through my power. It's not through my godliness. And I like what he says at the end of verse 12. He says, listen, why do you marvel at this? Why? Why does it amaze you? Peter's point was very simple. Jesus healed all sorts of people when he walked this earth. Why should it seem strange that Jesus would continue to heal from heaven? And friends, I want you to know this. I mean, I, I say this on the basis of what the Bible says it. I, I base it on my personal experience. I base it on what I've seen with my own eyes. I, I tell you that Jesus Christ still heals people today. And, and we should know it. We should believe it. Matter of fact, two weeks ago when we were last in the book of Acts, do you remember on that Sunday morning, we, we had some special guests leading worship, Terry and Nancy Clark, right? Right? I really love Terry and Nancy. It was wonderful that they could come out and lead worship for us. Well, uh, just last night, I got a text message from Terry Clark. This is what he said. He said, hey, David, I just got a report that a man who was in terrible pain and headed for back surgery was visiting Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara, the morning we were there, and as he worshipped, he was healed. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I believe it. Now look, I don't want to imply for a moment that there's some kind of magic to the healing. I don't want to say that there's some system. If you do A, B, and C, then guaranteed God will heal you. I don't want to act if we can always figure out why God may heal, why he may delay healing, why he may, at least in our observation, not heal in a particular situation. I don't have all that figured out. But all I do know is that there are certain times and certain places where God does wonderful works of healing in people, and we should be very grateful for it, and we should expect that God would do more of it and not less of it. And that's what Peter said. Why do you marvel at this? Jesus did a lot of healing on this earth. He's ascended to heaven. He's a still wonderful God who does this. But, but, but Peter didn't just leave it at that. Now, starting at verse 13, he's really going to start preaching Jesus. So take a look at it here, verse 13. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Now, the way Peter begins his words in verse 13 is very thoughtful. It's very uh, much knowledgeable, building a bridge to his audience. He begins by saying, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. Hey, guys, I am a Jewish man just like you. I'm talking about the same God, the covenant God of Israel, the God of our patriarchs, the same God. He's building a bridge with the people he's talking to, right? And then he says, he glorified his servant Jesus. And he brings up that beautiful phrase there in verse 13, his servant Jesus. By the way, let me just tell you, the greatness of this sermon that Peter preached there on the Temple Mount, somewhere near the beautiful gate, the beauty of this sermon is that it focuses so much on Jesus. The, 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 Peter's, the, the, excuse me, the, the sermon is not primarily about Peter. It's not primarily about what Peter did or what happened with the layman. The sermon is overwhelmingly about Jesus. And the first thing Peter said about Jesus in the sermon is that he drew attention to the idea that Jesus was the servant of the Lord, which is something spoken of over and over again in the Hebrew Scriptures, which we call the Old Testament. Scriptural passages such as Isaiah chapter 42 and that great passage, Isaiah chapter 53, which actually begins in Isaiah chapter 52. That this idea of the servant of the Lord, it was very well known in Israel because of these Bible passages. And when he said his servant Jesus, wow, he was the servant of the Lord. He fulfills this great office. So in his first few lines, man, he's really building bridges with his audience. We serve the same God. I'm telling you about the Messiah, his servant Jesus. And then in his next words, he takes that beautiful bridge that he built with his audience. And in my mind, he just burns those bridges down. Look at what he says next. Did you notice it there? Again, we're talking about verse 13. 
The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, comma, now burning down the bridge, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the Prince of Life. Wow. Now listen, I want you to notice something. It was a miracle that God healed that lame man at the gate beautiful, right? I'll tell you, it was a whole nother miracle of God, the boldness that God gave Peter to address that audience. Was that not a miracle as well? To, to look at people and to say, you know what? You killed your own Messiah. You sent him to the cross. I don't think for a moment that was something that they have. I don't think there were nice smiles on everybody's faces when Peter said that. I'm sure at the very best, they, they were deeply troubled and concerned. It wasn't what they wanted to hear. But Peter boldly set the guilt of Jesus' death where it belonged. He said, listen, Pilate put him to death, but you egged him on to do it. Pilate was determined to let him go, but the Jewish mob insisted on the crucifixion of Jesus. And I have to say, this is a delicate point that I need to discuss just for a moment here. Because there are some people who are afraid to teach what Peter clearly taught here. That, that, that the Jewish people were responsible for sending Jesus to the cross. And I tell you, let me explain to you carefully why people are hesitant to teach that. Because there has been, in the history of the church, the most horrible and terrible persecution of the Jewish people and a lot of it under the term Christ killers. Christians have looked at Jews and they've said, you're Christ killers. You killed the Messiah. You deserve persecution. You deserve punishment. And we, the church, will be the agents of that persecution and punishment. Now listen, we do not want to say for a moment that Jews should be called Christ killers. And not just should they ever be persecuted for that. But on the other hand, we can't back down for a moment for saying that the Jewish people, those people in Jerusalem, that crowd gathered together in that Passover when Jesus went to the cross, they sent Jesus to the cross. But listen, God knew exactly what he was doing with all this. God was very careful to make sure that even though it was the Jewish people that sent their Messiah to the cross, it was not only the Jewish people, right? God made, took such great care that the responsibility for Jesus' crucifixion was both upon Jew and Gentile. Friends, who was responsible? Well, the Romans were responsible. Without Pilate, it could have never happened, right? It could have never happened. Jesus could have never been crucified without the partition of Pilate and the Roman Gentile authorities. On the other hand, it was the Jews who instigated that whole process. So I want you to notice something very carefully here. God allowed it that it was both Jew and Gentile who had their hands dirty in that shameful work of sending Jesus to the cross. Do the Jewish people of that generation bear some responsibility? Absolutely they do, but so do the Gentile people. But friends, let's go a little deeper, should we not? Jesus did not go to the cross as a victim of circumstances. Jesus didn't go because he was just sort of railroaded by bad justice. Jesus was in complete command of the whole situation. At any time, Jesus had the authority of a legion of angels on his side, and he could have backed out of the whole arrangement at any time. No, he went. He went because he went to that cross to save lost humanity. And who were the ones who were lost? You and I. If I want to blame somebody for the death of Jesus... You know who I should blame? I should look in the mirror and blame myself. It was my sin that put him on the cross. It was my sin that drove him to that ultimate execution and to pour out his life on that cruel piece of wood. But I'll say it plainly. I, I, I know you're thinking it, but I'll just say it. It was your sin also. And I believe it's very true 
That if there was just one of us who needed the salvation that Jesus had to bring from the cross, if there was just one of us that Jesus had to die for, he would have went to the cross for you or for me. But if it was only me, then it also would have been me nailing him to that cross. And so friends, here's the point. Yes, Peter spoke the truth when he told that, that, that largely Jewish audience that you delivered up, you denied him. But we should not think for a moment that it was only the Jewish people of that generation that bore the guilt of Jesus' death. But notice the contrast. In God's estimation, Jesus is the exalted servant who was promised centuries before in the Hebrew Scriptures. In man's estimation, Jesus was only worthy to be tortured and crucified. But that's not how God thought about him at all. Look again at our text where it says there in verse 14, but you denied the Holy One and the just. By the way, this is exalting Jesus even more. When he called Jesus the Holy One, just do a word search in your Bible sometime. Pick up your concordance or type it into your Bible search engine or whatever you, how you do it. You'll find that phrase, Holy One, used more than 40 times in the Old Testament. And most every time it's used as a reference to the Lord God who reigns in heaven. The covenant God of Israel. He is the Holy One. And do you see what Peter's doing when he calls Jesus the Holy One? He's saying he's God. This man who walked among us, he is God at the same time. And so he says, laying it on them very strongly, verse 14, you ask for a murderer to be granted to you. That's a reference to Barabbas, for whom the crowd asked for. And so he asked for it again and again. He made the point uh, very plain to them, verse 12, and you killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead. By the way, when I notice Peter speaking to the audience so plainly here in verses 13, 14, and 15, I find a word that dominates. And you know what the word that dominates is? It's you. You did this. He says, you delivered up and denied. You denied the Holy One and the just. And then by implication, you asked for a murder to be granted to you. You killed the Prince of Life. Peter was laying at home and speaking to them about their sin. And by the way, I think there's a real place for that in the world today. For what we might call, if we want to call it preaching, we'll call it direct preaching, right? Preaching that speaks right to the hearts of people, right to where you're at. Preaching that isn't primarily engineered to, to win friends and, and influence people. But to say, listen, uh, th th there's a problem between you and God, and, and God has done this to make it right. You need to receive God's solution to your problem of sin. And, and this is what Peter wanted them to know, even using the very dramatic phrase there in verse 15, that they killed the prince of life. What a contrast right there. How can you kill the prince of life? Well, they did it by sending him to the cross, but he couldn't stay dead. And that's why he says they're glorious uh, gloriously assured of his resurrection, verse 15, you killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. And so now in verse 16, Peter's going to bring it back to the man who was healed. He says, and his name through faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him perfect, this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. I find it very interesting that Peter said that this man was healed through faith in his name, meaning the name of Jesus. Now, this means more that when Peter did this, he said, in Jesus' name. Do you understand what it means to do something in Jesus' name? It's not just a nice way to conclude a prayer. Don't we kind of have that custom of prayer? I mean, I kind of do. You close a prayer by saying, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, can I just tell you? Saying those words doesn't mean that it's done in Jesus' name. To do something in Jesus' name means to do it in his authority, in his heart, in his attitude, the way Jesus would do it. You're acting on behalf of Jesus, just like you would do anything else in somebody else's name, right? If you were to do something in somebody's name, you would be acting on their behalf. Well, Jesus says, I give you the authority to do things in my name. And that's exactly what Peter was trying to explain to them, that it was in the name of Jesus that this happened. That Peter 
consciously did this in the authority and the power of Jesus, not in the authority and power of Peter. Which comforts us, right? Because when he picked that lame man up and said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk, he knew he was doing it in Jesus' power and authority, not in his own. Peter wouldn't take even credit even for the faith that was exercised in the healing. Did you notice what he said in verse 16? He said, yes, the faith which comes through him has given him perfect soundness in the presence of all. Peter says, I wouldn't even take credit for the faith. That faith came through him, through Jesus. But I think it's such an important point there in verse 16 where it says that through faith in his name, this amazing work was done. You know, I believe that whenever God's people do really good work in this world, they do it through faith in his name. But the temptation for Christians, for, for the followers of Jesus, for the church, if you want to call it that, the temptation is always to do things trusting in something or in something else. We're, we're constantly being tested to trust in something else than the name, the nature of Jesus. So sometimes we want to trust in our good intentions. Your intentions may be good, but that's not good enough. Sometimes we want to trust in our talents and our gifts. I mean, I see how that's easy to do. You look at the people in this room. There's a lot of gifts. There's a lot of talents here. It would be very easy for us to think, man, with the smart people and the skilled people and the talented people and all that in this room, man, if we just put our heads together on anything, we could accomplish it. But friends, that's not how we're supposed to operate. We're supposed to operate very consciously doing things through faith in his name, not through faith in our own talents and gifts. So sometimes we find it easy to trust in material resources. We think, man, you know, the solution, if we just throw enough resources, enough money at the problem, well, then that'll fix things. No, that's not to be our place of trust either. Sometimes, and I think that this, this is a temptation for a congregation such as ours, sometimes we find it easy to trust in reputation and prior success. Well, listen, God has blessed this congregation, is it not? You know, through the ministry of Ricky Ryan and just the wonderful, wonderful work that's been done here over the decades. Not over the years, over the decades. What a great reputation this congregation has in the community. What a beautiful record of just prior success in serving God. And all that is a glorious heritage. But at the same time, it's a trap, isn't it? It's a trap to trust in reputation and to trust in prior success instead of trusting that we're going to do things through the name of Jesus. I think also it's easy just to trust in hard work or smart work, but no, we deny all of those things and we say, no, we're always going to trust in and we're always going to do good through faith in his name, through what Jesus gives us to do. And now, starting at verse 17, Peter continues on his message. He says this, yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ should suffer, he is thus fulfilled. I like this, and to me it shows such a warm heart on behalf of Peter. Because just a few verses before it, he really laid it on him, didn't he? I mean, that was strong. He gave them some strong medicine. And now starting at verse 17, what does he do? He gives them a great big hug. I like that. I, I like both of those things together. Even though po Peter spoke very boldly to them about their sin, he didn't hate them. Look at the first couple words of verse 17. Yet now, brethren. He didn't say, yet now, you filthy, disgusting wretches. Right? Right? Isn't that the vibe you get from some preachers, right? It's easy to tell people about their sin. Oh, you're such a sinner because there's something inside each one of us that knows we fail, we fall short of God's glory. It is actually not very difficult most of the time. There's a few hardened cases out there. But most of the time, it's not very difficult to persuade people that they're sinners. No, what you need to do is be able to tell them that, to remind them of that, but then put your arms around them and love them. Just like Peter said, he said, yet now, brethren. You know why I think Peter had a special connection to these guys as brethren? And why he could say it? And I don't want to get over dramatic with this, but, but I wonder if there wasn't just a little bit of a tear welling up in Peter's eyes as he said that, yet now, brethren. This is why. Twice before, in verse 13 and verse 14, 
Peter accused them of denying the Lord. Should we look at that again? Verse 13. Whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate. And there's verse 14. But you denied the Holy One. Now, isn't that interesting that Peter would speak such a way, right? You denied him just like I did. And God has forgiven me. I want you to have his forgiveness. I've dealt with my denial of Jesus but because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's been the means to which I've been able to deal with this and know that God has forgiven. I want you, you people who denied him as well in your own way. I denied him in my way. You denied him in your way. I want you to have what I have. Listen, that kind of broken hearted, open hearted preaching to people that that reaches people, doesn't it? Not where you stand on some throne of superiority above them and said, I'm here to bring a message to you wretched sinners. With enough effort, you can come up to the glorious level that I have reached. Peter wasn't like that at all. He knew what it was like to deny Jesus. And that's why it stuck so much in his heart. I don't want you guys to be there. I want you to receive what I have received from God. And that's why he can say, and again, I don't want to sound melodramatic if, if I just think that maybe a tear was welling up in Peter's eyes when he says, yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. Now, by the way, would you notice something here? Just because they did it in ignorance doesn't mean that it didn't matter. And that's the way most of us think about sin today. Honestly, that's sort of the prevailing way we think of it in the world today. That if you sin in ignorance, it doesn't count, right? Well, friends, no. God holds us to account for our sins committed in ignorance. Now, I, I want to make it very clear. It, it, it didn't make them innocent. They, they were guilty of those sins, but it does carefully define the nature of their guilt. If we sin in ignorance, it's still sin, but it is different from a sin that's done with full knowledge. It's worse to sin with full knowledge, but it's still sin if we sin in ignorance. I don't want to depress you here this morning, but think about all the ways you've sinned against God ignorantly. You, you didn't know better, but you still did it. Lives were still hurt. Others were damaged. You were damaged. And somehow maybe you thought that it didn't count, that God just said, okay, well, I'll let you off that one. You did it in ignorance. God says, no. Jesus died on the cross even for our sins that were committed in ignorance. But again, going back to verse 17 now. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. God was in control at the cross. I know that the Jews and the Romans collectively sent Jesus to the cross, but God was at work at the cross fulfilling his plan, making the sacrifice that would atone for the sins of humanity. And so now at verse 19, Peter calls them to repentance. Look at how boldly he does it. He says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And notice what he says, just like he did in his first message back that we saw in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 3, when Peter preaches a second time, he tells people to repent. Do you see that in verse 19? Repent therefore. Peter told them to turn around in their thinking and actions. And that's what repentance is. I won't explain it in great depth here because we talked about it just a few weeks ago in Acts chapter 2. But repentance is a very important word in the Christian life. And might I say, it's an important word in the Christian life. It's not just those who have yet to surrender their lives to Jesus who need to repent. It's Christians too. When Jesus spoke to his churches in the book of Revelation, seven different churches Jesus spoke to, five out of the seven, he told them to repent. So I don't know what that is statistically, but that's a pretty high proportion of Christians who need to be told to repent. 
And this is God's message, not only to those who have yet to put their faith in Jesus, but also to us, those who are or think of ourselves as followers of Jesus. We need to repent. We need to turn around. And it's not a word primarily about being sorry. It's not primarily a word about, about how you think or how you feel. It's about turning around. And he also had said here that repentance is a word of hope. You thought wrongly about Jesus before. Now you can think rightly about him. I like this too. That this whole idea that when Peter's called out before them, repent and be converted, it shows that when Peter spoke boldly to them about their sin, it wasn't just for the sake of making them feel bad. He wanted their lives to be changed by the power of God. So he says, repent therefore and be converted. Peter knew the necessity of conversion, of God's work bringing us new life. Being a Christian is not turning over a new leaf. It's not a self-improvement program. It's not the desires, well, I'll do better now. No, it's saying, God, change my life. Convert me. Change me. Because being a new creation in Jesus Christ, that's what it is to be a follower of Jesus. And so he is continuing on here in this verse 18, excuse me, 19, where he says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. That's the first benefit of repentance. I see here in the text, between here and the end of the chapter, four benefits of repentance. And the first one is simply that your sins may be blotted out. That the one who repents and is converted is forgiven them their sins. And by the way, the record itself is erased. I want you to think very carefully about that. The the person who repents and is converted, they put their faith in Jesus Christ. They have, if you want to use this phrase, they surrender their life to Jesus. Their sins are blotted out before God. Does that sound like a good deal to you? Because listen, for some of you, you've got a pretty long rap sheet before God. Actually, if I could put it more accurately, don't we all have a pretty long rap sheet before God? And how are we going to get rid of that? Well, some people think that for every good thing you do, God crosses off a bad thing from that rap sheet, right? Do you think it works that way? I don't think so. God's a righteous judge. You try that the next time you appear before a judge. The the next time you get that ticket for going through a red light, you know, not stopping at a stop sign, just tell the judge, officer or judge, I stopped at that stop sign 50 times before I ever ran right through it. I should get credit for all of those 50, right? What would the judge tell you? He said, no, you're guilty of this one. No, all the good you do doesn't erase your rap sheet. You, you, you could say this, all the transgressions, maybe you thought that time would erode it. Many people think that way. They think about the sins they committed when they were young, and they say what? They say, well, that was a long time ago. Well, listen, it doesn't change the fact that it's real before God. No, time won't erase it. Your good deeds won't erase it. But Jesus says that if you'll repent and be converted, your record will be blotted out. And it's really sort of an interesting phrase he uses from the original language. Back then, when they were right, they would use inks that, unlike modern inks, they didn't have an acid content. Today, modern inks have an acid content to them, so they sort of bite into the paper. But back then, these inks had no acid content, and so they just laid on top of the paper. And so you could literally take a parchment or a papyrus or whatever and take a damp rag and just wipe over it and wipe off all the ink. That's what God's done for us. He's blotted out the record against us for those who repent and are converted. That's one benefit. And then the next thing he says, it's right there in verse 19, He says, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This was the second benefit of repenting and turning to God. In speaking of these times of refreshing, Peter referred to the time when Jesus would return and rule the earth in righteousness. But in a lesser, though glorious sense, God sends times of refreshing to his people today. Some of us, we just need to be refreshed in our lives. You need something new. You need God to be doing something new in you. And listen, to those who repent and are converted, God will send a time of refreshing into your life. Going on here, starting at verse 22, he's going to talk more about these benefits of repentance. He says, listen, verse 22, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. 
Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets, from Samuel and those who follow, as many who have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, In your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning every one of you away from your iniquities. The, the, the Jewish people of Peter's day were aware of the prophecy of Moses that said that after I'm gone, God's going to send a servant or a prophet after me. And they wondered who that might be. Peter announces to them, Jesus Christ was that anticipated prophet. He's the one who fulfills this. And then going on, he points out here that every soul who will not hear that prophet will be utterly destroyed. That's in verse 23. Friends, do you get the point here? The third benefit of repentance is that you're spared this promised judgment. I know it's an uncomfortable thing for people to talk about or sometimes hear about in church, judgment. But but I'll talk about it because I think the Bible teaches it. And at the end of the day, my responsibility before God, it's not to please people. It's not to tickle the ears of my hearers. It's just to explain what the Bible explains. And so as long as I'm on good biblical grounds, I think I can just speak frankly about it. That for those who reject what God has given to them in Jesus Christ, judgment awaits them. And how could it be any different? God goes to the ultimate to provide salvation, rescue to the human race. He sends his son. And he sends his son not just to live, not just to fulfill the law with his life, But he sends his son to do works of good and love and compassion all over. And he sends his son finally to make atonement as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, dying on a cross. This is what God does for the world. And there are people who look at it and say, no thanks. Now, I don't know how there shouldn't be some kind of penalty for that. How there shouldn't be some sort of judgment that would await that. And I know the instinct that many people have, and I understand especially in the way that that we just think in our culture. They think, okay, that's great. That's one way, God. Beautiful that you provided this one way to get right with you at the cross. But you should provide other ways as well. Not just Jesus, but other ways. Again, I understand why, why this sort of very open impulse comes in in our society. In a lot of ways, that open impulse is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But I think that when somebody else looks at God and says you should provide another way other than what Jesus did at the cross, I think of somebody standing there at the foot of the cross, looking at the Son of God in agony, bearing the sins of the world, bearing all the wrath, all the judgment, all the guilt, all the shame my sin and your sin deserves. There he is. We watch Jesus on the cross bearing that, and then we turn to God and we say, oh God, that's good, but can you do something more? And to think how, how horrible it would be to say that. How God would respond from heaven with all the compassion in his heart. What more can I do? This is the ultimate. And for somebody to see this and to hear this and then to reject it. Well, let me just say this. The third blessing that comes from repenting and turning to God is being spared promised judgment. God offers you and I a way out. And he does it all in the context of this covenant that he started way back with Abraham. That's where we read right here in verse 25. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's plan in the beginning was to bless all the families of the world through what Jesus did. And he is doing that very much today. And then he concludes this message right here at verse 26. I love this. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Why did God send forth Jesus? 
to bless you. To bless you. Not to condemn you, but to bless you. Receive him and you will be blessed. You could say this is the fourth blessing that comes from repenting and turning to God. Jesus blesses us from heaven. But look at the blessing that's promised there in verse 26. I think it's a very interesting blessing. It's a blessing that some people don't want. You say, well, how can some people not want a blessing? Here's a blessing that some people don't want. The blessing in turning every one of you away from your iniquities. It's as if Jesus comes before you and he goes, I've got a blessing for you. Oh, Jesus, what's that blessing? My blessing is to turn you away from your sins. Well, Jesus, I, I don't want that blessing. I like my sins. I'd like to hold on to them very much, thank you. Jesus says, well, no. If you join me, if you follow after me, I'm going to work in you to turn you away from your sins. Do you want that? You see, to me, I like how this puts it because it sort of solves a problem in theology for many people. Friends, you can come to Jesus today just as you are. You don't have to clean yourself up before you come to God. You, you can have walked in here staggered and you might not even know why you're here. You, you may be the, the, the most desperate, most difficult life problem person in here. All sorts of just, just awful. Th that could be you. you. You could have sins that are known. You could have sins that are unknown. On, on. You get the picture, right? And just as you are right here, right now, Jesus will embrace you and he'll draw you into himself. But he'll tell you this, as he draws you to himself, he'll whisper in your ear, I'm going to change your life. And at that moment, either you'll push him away or you'll hug him right back. He says, I'll change your life. Now, is that what you want? Honestly, there are people who don't. Honestly, there are people who say, I like the way I have it now. I, I know it's wrong, but I like how I have it. Jesus, when you whispered in my ear, I'm going to change your life, I'll push you away. Friends, that's certainly your choice. But I think it's the wrong choice. Don't you want to hug Jesus back and say, you know what, Jesus, you made me, you see me, you know me. Any way you want to change my life, that's fine with me. I'll receive it as a blessing. Let me read it one more time. He sent Jesus to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. That's what God wants to do. Let's pray about this right now. And uh, we'll prepare our hearts for communion. Father, that's my prayer for all of us, that we would receive this glorious work of Jesus. That we would know that you embrace us just as we are, but you really do have that determination to change our life, Lord. Lord, I, I pray, thinking that there might be some here this morning that have fought against you, Lord, in the past. Lord, I pray that you'd bring them to a place of surrender. Not by guilt, not by manipulation, that they would simply feel drawn by your love. Do that, Lord. Do that for your wonderful, wonderful work in this world. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.